The vitriolic controversy developing around... Okay, so he's talking about the bell curve. He's saying, well, there's all this controversy about the bell curve. Now let's hear what he has to say here, though. This is the part I want to get to. Be biased. We live twice as long as people in some of the poorer parts of the world, not because we are more deserving, individually smarter, or otherwise more meritorious, but simply because we have the dumb luck to be born into a culture which produces cures and preventions for deadly diseases that have ravaged the human race for centuries. All right. So the reason you have it nice is because you had the dumb luck to be born here. And this is why I wanted to know, is he a Christian? Let's bring up paint here. I mean, here's the idea that he's presenting, you know, whether he realizes it or not. And I think he does because he's a smart guy. So here we're going to have a conveyor belt, right? Conveyor belt here. And we'll have some little babies. Goo goo gaga. Babies or fetuses, right? Or, you know, uh, moment of conception kind of stuff, right? Little babies. And then we'll have a big hopper. And we're going to type in... It's the soul hopper. And then we'll make the soul a light blue, just for funsies. Like, here's a soul, here's a soul. These are all just human souls waiting for a baby that needs them. Right? Just waiting to be born into a baby. And let me do this. And then this. And then four of them. Yeah, I know there's some overlap here. But uh, the basic implication is, oh, well, you know, this this baby's in Japan, and this baby's in the United States, and this baby's in India, and this baby is in China, right? And, hey, you know, here's you. Here's you, and this is this is your soul. And you will be... You might be in this China baby, or you might be this India baby. I mean, those are the two biggest populations in the world, so a lot of souls are going there, right? And um, this one's in, uh, uh, let's say, Argentina, right? You, you might be an India baby. You might be a, a Chinese baby. You might be an Argentina baby, baby. It's just like whatever baby was underneath the soul hopper when you were going to go out. That's the idea he's presenting, because he says, the reason we, okay, the reason we live longer than someone born in some other part of the world is because, he says, we had the dumb luck to be born here, right? You just popped out of the hopper at the right time. Now, as far as I understand, most Christians have not prescribed to this, uh, or most Christians have not taken this sort of idea seriously. This is not like a common historical conception of the soul. As far as I understand, a couple of the more common conceptions of the soul is that on conception, or at some point, um, God creates a soul for you, or... Um, God created one soul for Adam, and Eve received a piece of that, you know, because she's his rib. And every person receives a component of your parents' souls, right? Like, there's those two major conceptions within the Christian uh, idea space historically. So this idea that he's presenting doesn't seem to fit... A historical Christian narrative, and I don't think he's a Christian anyway. I think he's just proposing this so he can say it's dumb luck. And I'm here to tell you, it's not. Okay? That's, this is not how that works. 
the reason the kids who grew up in New York um, have the Empire State Building is because their ancestors, or their very recent ancestors, built it, right? And their very recent ancestors put up with construction. I mean, you got to remember, five people died while building this. And the reason some other people in some other part of the world don't have an Empire State Building is because they didn't build it. The stuff you have might not have to do with you being individually smarter or more meritorious. The stuff you have has to do with your ancestors making the sacrifice to create that stuff for you. That's it. Why does this group of people have sailing ships and this group of people who also live on a coastline not have sailing ships? Well, because the ancestors of the people with the ships built the ships. That's why. They went out of their way to build ships. They went out of their way to make these things that could be handed down. And so I don't prescribe to this. I'm going to take a very biological, right? Biological interpretation. Have you ever heard of the phrase standing on the shoulders of giants? Uh, in this case, I'm going to be using it to refer to, you know, a lot of times this has to do with uh, sort of like intellectual progress and philosophy. I'm going to be doing it to refer to sort of our material wealth, including like the building of hospitals and uh, MRI machines and all that right uh well you every you can look at every culture in the world right you can go to japan and you can watch the japanese children play in their parks uh and a lot of those parks may have been originally created during the uh meiji restoration or something so the people who built them are dead but the people who built them built them in part to pass down to their ancestors, to pass down to the people who live there now. Why do I not have a park from the Meiji Restoration? Well, because my people didn't create that sort of thing, right? Every current human group is in a position in part because of their ancestors. Their ancestors helped determine where they would be at today. That's just simply the way things are. We're all standing on the shoulders of our ancestors because that's their gift to us. Now, on some level, their gift to us is a place on their shoulder, right? So they went through all this effort, and there's a place in the world on that giant's shoulder, right? It's for you. Now, obviously, Thomas Sowell is in a rough position, right? Because he's sort of borrowing a seat on some ancestor, someone else's ancestor's shoulders, right? I mean, here he is posting this picture of uh, these buildings, mostly built by some other group, some other giants, not his giants. So he's in a rough position because it's sort of, it could be maybe on some level painful for him to admit that he's borrowing a seat that would be normally for one of us, right? But that's just the way it is. And this is where we can talk about John Cleese. Let's take a, let's take a look at this. I think you did had a great eye for British culture. What do you make of British culture now, particularly after the riots that we've seen? I'm not, uh, I'm not sure what's going on in Britain. Uh, it, um, or let me say this, I, I don't know what's going on in London, because London is no longer an English city, and that's how they got the Olympics. I mean, they said we're the most cosmopolitan city on earth, but it doesn't feel English. I had a Californian friend come over two months ago, walk down the King's Road and said to me, well, where are all the English people? So, there you go. We're starting to see the same sort of idea. 
let's talk about language. This is something that I talked to American Krogan with about. You know, there's a Latin word, and I don't know how to pronounce re- uh, reconstructed or ecclesiastical Latin, so bear with me. But it's something like tradere, right? Tra or trans means across. Dere or dare means to give, to give across. And there's a couple understandings of tradere. For example, let's say your father had a sword, had a sword that his father had given to him. Well, eventually, he may plan to give that sword to you. He may tradere that sword to you. And if he does that, that would be the good tradere. And that word, tradere, tradere, again, I don't know how to pronounce it, eventually morphed over a couple thousand years into our word, tradition, right? Let's talk about the bad tradere, though. Okay. Let's say your father took that sword, though, that he got from his father, and instead he pawned it. He sold it to a traveling merchant, and you would never see it again because he needed that money for booze, right? That tradere is the bad tradere. That eventually becomes the English word betrayal. Let's bring up paint. So it's like tradere becomes tra addition and b which is uh, like an english prefix and trail so if you were to read old latin texts you would see tradere and you would sometimes see a good tradere and a bad tradere and The good one we now call tradition, and the bad one we now call betrayal. But what is the big difference between the good tradere and the bad tradere? The good one and the bad one. The distinction is who you're giving it to, right? The word in both cases has to do with giving. You are are giving across. The difference between good and bad, the difference between tradition and betrayal, is who you decide to give it to. That's it. And on some level, John Cleese understands this. If you were to go to 11th century London, and you were to go see them consecrate the Westminster Abbey, all right? Which would be, you know, like a thousand years ago, you would go see them do this. You would see the English people in London. And they would make this stupendous, miraculous, wonderful thing. But it would be time at some point for them to go and their, their uh, ancestors, their offspring, to take over. They would tradere this this um abbey and the whole city of london to a new generation of english people and then that generation would one day have to pass and they would give on the city to the next generation of english people so on and so forth for a thousand years just as you have cities in the middle east that yeah, like Tehran, that have been passed from generation to generation, one after another, tradere, tradition, the pass from yourself to your offspring. But then John Cleese notices that, gosh, there aren't English people here anymore. This tradere has gone bad. What is the bad betrayal in English? Oh, what's the bad tradition in English? It's betrayal. John Cleese, I don't know if John Cleese fully understands it. I, and if he did understand it, I don't know if he would say it. 
but he can tell on some level that betrayal has happened here. This group used to live here, and now they don't. A betrayal has taken place. I think he can feel it deep down in his bones. Again, I don't know if he understands it. And if he did understand it, I don't know if he'd be willing to say it. He might be willing to say it if it was about some other group, right? If there was a mass replacement of in Tehran and all the Persians, the uh, Iranians were kicked out and someone else came in, he might be able to speak out about it. Or Accra, which is that uh, is the capital of uh, Ghana. And if all the black people got displaced, he might be able to come to terms with it more and actually call it what it is, a betrayal, right? Now, if these people left London, they could go to where they came from. They could receive what their ancestors left for them. They could go reoccupy the shoulders of their giants, and we could occupy the shoulders of ours. We could undo this betrayal, we could restore this tradition. After all, the English people were not asked if they wanted all this tradition to go away. The English people weren't asked if they wanted this betrayal. But, you know, I don't know if John Cleese is willing to go there. I don't know if John Cleese actually wants to buy um, his father's sword back. And the thing is, John Cleese, no offense to him, I mean, John Cleese is, at this point, an old man, right? He's been very successful. If there's anybody who has the sort of financial position and position in life where he could, where someone would call it betrayal, it's him, right? I mean, imagine a young man, 20 years old, he's got a wife and two kids, he can't get fired. If he gets fired, his whole his whole family's in jeopardy. His 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 kids could be taken away from him by the government for suggesting that this is betrayal. He can't do it. John Cleese maybe could, but I don't think John Cleese is going to. Because I don't think John Cleese has it in him. Now I have heard that John Cleese might be working on a documentary. Someone told me that John Cleese might be working on a documentary on wokeism and how it has negatively impacted comedians and if he does do that that's fine i guess i i would expect if he does something like that it'll have a lot of punches pulled it'll probably be a generally half-hearted attempt and probably won't go anywhere because it won't ultimately push back on the real issues London will remain a non-English city.